Letter to a Young Gentleman Who Proposes to Embrace the Career of Art by Robert Louis Stevenson With the agreeable frankness of youth, you address me on a point of some practical importance to yourself and, it is even conceivable, of some gravity to the world. Should you or should you not become an artist? It is one which you must decide entirely for yourself. All that I can do is to bring under your notice some of the materials of that decision. And I will begin, as I shall probably conclude also, by assuring you that all depends on the vocation. To know what you like is the beginning of wisdom and of old age. Youth is wholly experimental. The essence and charm of that unquiet and delightful epoch is ignorance of self as well as ignorance of life. These two unknowns the young man brings together again and again, now in the airiest touch, now with a bitter hug, now with exquisite pleasure, now with cutting pain, and never with indifference to which he is a total stranger, and never with that near kinsman of indifference, contentment. If he be a youth of dainty senses, or a brain easily heated, the interest of this series of experiments grows upon him out of all proportion to the pleasure he receives. It is not beauty that he loves, nor pleasure that he seeks, though he may think so. His design and his sufficient reward is to verify his own existence and taste the variety of human fate. To him, before the razor edge of curiosity is dulled, all that is not actual living and the hot chase of experience wears a face of a disgusting dryness difficult to recall in later days. Or, if there be any exception, and here destiny steps in, it is in those moments when, wearied or surfeited of the primary activity of the senses, he calls up before memory the image of transacted pains and pleasures. Thus it is that such a one shies from all cut-and-dry professions and inclines insensibly toward that career of art which consists only in the tasting and recording of experience. This, which is not so much a vocation for art as an impatience of all other honest trades, frequently exists alone, and so existing it will pass gently away in the course of years. Emphatically, it is not to be regarded it is not a vocation, but a temptation. And when your father the other day so fiercely and, in my view, so properly discouraged your ambition, he was recalling, not improbably, some similar passage in his own experience. For the temptation is perhaps nearly as common as the vocation is rare. But again, we have vocations which are imperfect. We have men whose minds are bound up not so much in any art as in the general ars artium, and common base of all creative work, who will now dip into painting, and now study counterpoint, and anon will be inditing a sonnet. All these with equal interest, all often with genuine knowledge, and of this temper when it stands alone, I find it difficult to speak. But I should counsel such a one to take to letters, for in literature, which drags with so wide a net, all his information may be found some day useful, and if he should go on as he has begun, and turn at last into the critic, he will have learned to use the necessary tools. Lastly, we come to those vocations which are at once decisive and precise, to the men who are born with the love of pigments, the passion of drawing, the gift of music, or the impulse to create with words, just as other and perhaps the same men are born with the love of hunting, or the sea, or horses, or the turning lathe. These are predestined. If a man love the labor of any trade, apart from any question of success or fame, the gods have called him. He may have the general vocation, too. He may have a taste for all the arts, and I think he often has. But the mark of his calling is this laborious partiality for one, this inextinguishable zest in its technical successes, and, perhaps above all, a certain candor of mind to take his very trifling enterprise with a gravity that would befit the cares of empire, and to think the smallest improvement worth accomplishing at any expense of time and industry. The Book The Statue the sonata, must be gone upon with the unreasoning good faith and the unflagging spirit of children at their play. Is it worth doing? When it shall have occurred to any artist to ask himself that question, it is implicitly answered in the negative. It does not occur to the child as he plays at being a pirate on the dining-room sofa, nor to the hunter as he pursues his quarry, and the candor of the one and the ardor of the other should be united in the bosom of the artist. If you recognize in yourself some such decisive taste, there is no room for hesitation. Follow your bent, and observe, lest I should too much discourage you, that the disposition does not usually burn so brightly at the first, or rather not so constantly. Habit and practice sharpen gifts. 
The necessity of toil grows less disgusting, grows even welcome in the course of years. A small taste, if it only be genuine, waxes with indulgence into an exclusive passion. Enough just now, if you can look back over a fair interval and see that your chosen art has a little more than held its own among the thronging interests of youth. Time will do the rest, if devotion help it, and soon your every thought will be engrossed in that beloved occupation. But even with devotion, you may remind me, even with unfaltering and delighted industry, many thousand artists spend their lives, if the result be regarded, utterly in vain. A thousand artists and never one work of art. But the vast mass of mankind are incapable of doing anything reasonably well, art among the rest. The worthless artist would not improbably have been a quite incompetent baker. And the artist, even if he does not amuse the public, amuses himself so that there will always be one man the happier for his vigils. This is the practical side of art. It's inexpugnable fortress for the true practitioner. The direct returns, the wages of the trade, are small, but the indirect, the wages of the life, are incalculably great. No other business offers a man his daily bread upon such joyful terms. The soldier and the explorer have moments of a worthier excitement, but they are purchased by cruel hardships and periods of tedium that beggar language. In the life of the artist, there need be no hour without its pleasure. I take the author, with whose career I am best acquainted, and it is true he works in a rebellious material, and that the act of writing is cramped and trying both to the eyes and the temper, but remark him in his study when matter crowds upon him and words are not wanting, in what a continual series of small successes time flows by. With what a sense of power as of one moving mountains he marshals his petty characters. With what pleasures both of the ear and eye he sees his airy structure growing on the page and how he labors in a craft to which the whole material of his life is tributary and which opens a door to all his tastes, his loves, his hatreds, and his convictions so that what he writes is only what he longed to utter. He may have enjoyed many things in this big tragic playground of the world, but what shall he have enjoyed more fully than a morning of successful work? Suppose it ill-paid. The wonder is it should be paid at all. Other men pay, and pay dearly for pleasures less desirable. Nor will the practice of art afford you pleasure only. It affords, besides, an admirable training. For the artist works entirely upon honor. The public knows little or nothing of those merits in the quest of which you are condemned to spend the bulk of your endeavors. Merits of design the merit of first-hand energy, the merit of a certain cheap accomplishment which a man of the artistic temper easily acquires, these they can recognize, and these they value. But to those more exquisite refinements of proficiency and finish which the artist so ardently desires and so keenly feels, for which, in the vigorous words of Balzac, he must toil like a miner buried in a landslip, for which, day after day, he recasts and revises and rejects, the gross mass of the public must be ever blind. To those lost pains, suppose you attain the highest pitch of merit, posterity may possibly do justice. Suppose, as is so probable, you fall by even a hair's breadth of the highest, rest certain they shall never be observed. Under the shadow of this cold thought, alone in this studio, the artist must preserve from day to day his constancy to the ideal. It is this which makes his life noble. It is by this that the practice of his craft strengthens and matures his character. It is for this that even the serious countenance of the great emperor was turningly approved, if only for a moment, on the followers of Apollo, and that sternly gentle voice bade the artist cherish his art. And here there fall two warnings to be made. First, if you are to continue to be a law to yourself, you must beware of the first signs of laziness. This idealism in honesty can only be supported by perpetual effort. The standard is easily lowered. The artist who says it will do is on the downward path. Three or four potboilers are enough at times, above all at wrong times, to falsify a talent, and by the practice of journalism a man runs the risk of becoming wedded to cheap finish. This is the danger on the one side. There is not less upon the other. The consciousness of how much the artist is and must be a law to himself debauches the small heads. Perceiving recondite merits, very hard to attain, making or swallowing artistic formulae, or perhaps falling in love with some particular proficiency of his own, many artists forget the end of all art, to please. 
It is doubtless tempting to exclaim against the ignorant bourgeoisie. Yet it should not be forgotten. It is he who is to pay us, and that, surely on the face of it, for services that he shall desire to have performed. Here also, if properly considered, there is a question of transcendental honesty. To give the public what they do not want and yet expect to be supported, we have there a strange pretension, and yet not uncommon, above all with painters. The first duty in this world is for a man to pay his way, and when that is quite accomplished, he may plunge into what eccentricity he likes, but emphatically not till then. Till then, he must pay assiduous court to the bourgeois who carries the purse. And if in the course of these capitulations he shall falsify his talent, it can never have been a strong one, and he will have preserved a better thing than talent, character. Or, if he be of a mind so independent that he cannot stoop to this necessity, one course is yet open. He can desist from art and follow some more manly way of life. I speak of a more manly way of life. It is a point on which I must be frank. To live by a pleasure is not a high calling. It involves patronage, however veiled. It numbers the artist, however ambitious, along with dancing girls and billiard markers. The French have a romantic evasion for one employment and call its practitioners the daughters of joy. The artist is of the same family. He is of the sons of joy, chose his trade to please himself, gains his livelihood by pleasing others, and has parted with something of the sterner dignity of man. Journals but a little while ago declaimed against the Tennyson peerage, and this son of joy was blamed for condescension when he followed the example of Lord Lawrence and Lord Cairns and Lord Clyde. The poet was more happily inspired. With a better modesty he accepted the honor, and anonymous journalists have not yet, if I am to believe them, recovered the vicarious disgrace to their profession. When it comes to their turn, these gentlemen can do themselves more justice, and I shall be glad to think of it, for to my barbarian eyesight, even Lord Tennyson looks somewhat out of place in that assembly. There should be no honors for the artist. He has already, in the practice of his art, more than his share of the rewards of life. The honors are preempted for other trades less agreeable and perhaps more useful. But the devil in these trades of pleasing is to fail to please. In ordinary occupations, a man offers to do a certain thing or to produce a certain article with a merely conventional accomplishment, a design in which, we may almost say, it is difficult to fail. But the artist steps forth out of the crowd and proposes to delight, an impudent design in which it is impossible to fail without odious circumstances. The poor daughter of joy, carrying her smiles and finery quite unregarded through the crowd, makes a figure which it is impossible to recall without a wounding pity. She is the type of the unsuccessful artist. The actor, the dancer, and the singer must appear like her in person and drain publicly the cup of failure. But though the rest of us escape this crowning bitterness of the pillory, we all court in essence the same humiliation. We all profess to be able to delight. And how few of us are. We all pledge ourselves to be able to continue to delight. And the day will come to each, and even to the most admired, when the ardor shall have declined and the cunning shall be lost, and he shall sit by his deserted booth ashamed. Then shall he see himself condemned to do work for which he blushes to take payment. Then, as if his lot were not already cruel, he must lie exposed to the jibes of the wreckers of the press who earn a little bitter bread by the condemnation of trash which they have not read, and the praise of excellence which they cannot understand. And observe that this seems almost the necessary end, at least of writers. Les Blancs et les Bleus, for instance, is of an order of merit very different from Les Vicomte de Braglion. And if any gentleman can bear to spy upon the nakedness of Castle Dangerous, his name, I think, is Ham. Let it be enough for the rest of us to read of it, not without tears, in the pages of Lockhart. Thus, in old age, when occupation and comfort are most needful, the writer must lay aside at once his pastime and his breadwinner. The painter, indeed, if he succeeded at all in engaging the attention of the public, gains great sums and can stand to his easel until a great age without dishonorable failure. The writer has the double misfortune to be ill-paid while he can work, and to be incapable of working when he is old. It is thus a way of life which conducts directly to a false position. For the writer, in spite of notorious examples to the contrary, must look to be ill-paid. Tennyson and Montpin make handsome livelihoods, but we cannot all hope to be Tennyson, and we do not 
or perhaps desire to be malt pin. If you adopt an art to be your trade, weed your mind at the outset of all desire of money. What you may decently expect, if you have some talent and much industry, is such an income as a clerk will earn with a tenth or perhaps a twelfth of your nervous output. Nor have you the right to look for more. In the wages of the life, not in the wages of the trade, lies your reward. The work is here, the wages. It will be seen I have little sympathy with the common lamentations of the artist class. Perhaps they do not remember the hire of the field laborer, or do they think no parallel will lie? Perhaps they have never observed what is the retiring allowance of a field officer, or do they suppose their contributions to the arts of pleasing more important than the services of a colonel? Perhaps they forget on how little Millet was content to live. Or do they think, because they have less genius, they stand excused from the display of equal virtues? But upon one point, there should be no dubiety. If a man be not frugal, he has no business in the arts. If he be not frugal, he steers directly for that last tragic scene of Le Vieux Sautimbon. If he be not frugal, he will find it hard to continue to be honest. Some day, when the butcher is knocking at the door, he may be tempted, he may be obliged, to turn out and sell a slovenly piece of work. If the obligation shall have arisen through no wantonness of his own, he is even to be commanded. For words cannot describe how far more necessary it is that a man should support his family than that he should attain to, or preserve, distinction in the arts. But if the pressure comes through his own fault, he has stolen, and stolen under trust, and stolen, which is the worst of all, in such a way that no law can reach him. And now you may perhaps ask me if the debutante artist is to have no thought of money, and if, as is implied, he is to expect no honors from the state, he may not at least look forward to the delights of popularity? Praise, you will tell me, is a savory dish, and insofar as you may mean the countenance of other artists, you would put your finger on one of the most essential and enduring pleasures of the career of art. But insofar as you should have an eye to the commendations of the public or the notice of the newspapers, be sure you would be but cherishing a dream. It is true that in certain esoteric journals the author, for instance, is duly criticized, and that he often is praised a great deal more than he deserves, sometimes for qualities which he prided himself on his chewing, and sometimes by ladies and gentlemen who have denied themselves the privilege of reading his work. But if a man be sensitive to this wild praise, we must suppose him equally alive to that which often accompanies and always follows it, wild ridicule. A man may have done well for years, and then he may fail. He will hear of his failure. Or he may have done well for years and still do well, but the critics have tired of praising him. Or there may have sprung up some new idol of the instant, some dust a little guilt, to whom they now prefer to offer sacrifice. Here is the obverse and the reverse of that empty and ugly thing called popularity. Will any man suppose it worth the gaining? The End Read by Rick Kistner